Post Live. Hey, we are live. That was unexpectedly fast. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to the Banff Podcast on our series of Owen Explains It All, uh, where Mr. Owen K. Stevens will tell us how to bring um, fun aspects of race pop culture into your RPG, particularly Starfinder game. How are you doing, Mr. Owen? I'm doing great. I'm doing good. I'm it is good to see you. I'm excited that we're digging into the bin of old stuff instead of something that just came out. Indeed, because today is Ice Pirates. You guys want to see the trailer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's see the trailer. Well, right. wait, you should do the logo first. I should do the logo first. One second. For you youngsters out there, that's the kind of guitar riff if your mom heard from your bedroom in 1984, she started to wonder if you were down with the devil music. Uh, and just before we watch this trailer, uh, Ice Pirates came out sort of towards the end of the era where people thought anything that vaguely looked like Star Wars would make money. Um, it's one of the last efforts at a big budget movie of that style. Uh, and it was originally going to be a movie called The Water Planet with a $20 million budget that was a serious sci-fi film. And then the budget got slashed from $20 million to $8 million. And the director and the producer went, well, we already spent some money on sets, so we're going to have to make this movie. You know what? Maybe if we make it a rock and rockish comedy of, of silly, almost Python-esque proportions, that'll be a hit, even though it's cheaper. So with that in mind, let's, let's watch the, the trailer. Can you guys hear that? Oh, yeah. Right. At last, the space comedy you didn't know you were waiting to see. The Ice Pirates. In the far distant future, in a galaxy where those in the know don't go, real estate is cheap, and they've got great sushi. But there's no water. You got any uh, water? It is a time when desperate men will swing from the chandeliers. So I feel like maybe we got the idea. Um, <laughs> from that 33 seconds, how do you, how do you guys feel? So. No, no, I, th I think that tells us everything we need to know. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, the, the explanation is in there. Uh, there it, I haven't just watched the rewatched the movie because I didn't see it for like 20 years. The yep. last time I saw it was over 20 years ago. Uh, I watched it again just last night, and there was a galactic war, and all the planets that had water were either destroyed or uh, lost most of their water supply during the battle. So there are only a few survivable planets left, and those that are left have very little water. It is the greatest source of, of, of treasure in, in the known galaxy. And that's basically the fiat of the, of the series. And, you know, it's very much a, a hang your reason and logic hat off to the side kind of movie, because one of the most common things in space are giant floating hunks of ice in zero G. So uh, if all the planets run out of water and you need to steal water, you're just going to go out to any asteroid belt, any, any ring on a planet. Uh, and, you know, they're talking about spanning galaxies and hopping to different systems. So they certainly have mobility and you're going to grab ice and you're going to use it. But, um, they wanted pirates. And this is one of the takeaways uh, from this movie. They are shameless. Uh, well, okay, that's another takeaway from this movie, and we'll get to that. This movie is shameless of stealing any idea or genre that it thinks will be fun in support of its plot. So uh, they want pirates. As a result, they come up with a commodity valuable enough for people to steal and that there are specific ports it flies from and goes to because for pirates you have to have a valuable commodity worth stealing you have to have uh routes that that commodity is is taken by where a pirate has a chance of picking it up and you have to have places that are perhaps not so ethical where you can sell your stolen commodity so they just bolt all that in but as we just saw they also for example uh, decided that fighting with swords would be fun and piratey and swashbuckly, and there's no justification for it. They don't explain why they've got laser guns and swords. They just say it's common, and they go with it. Same with the outfits. They're wearing very piratey, swashbuckly outfits, 
not exactly like you would have seen in, in Captain Blood, perhaps, but very much leaning that direction. So there's an aesthetic. But then, as you can see from the shot with the giant two-wheeled car with the skull on it, uh, they had a segment where they decided what they really wanted to do was a Mad Max pastiche. Now, if you look, when this movie came out, Swashbuckling Films and Mad Max and Star Wars, which has laser swords, obviously, and is in heavy armor, uh, and Alien, and we'll get to that in a minute, are all recent memory when this movie was getting written and made. <clears throat> so they clearly just picked the things they thought would be fun and threw them all in a blender and did not worry too much about whether or not those things made logical sense. And they do that for the purpose of just getting to the story, get to the interesting parts, move forward. If you've got a group of people who are willing to take that approach on a role-playing game, you can very much do the same thing. Hey, the universe is short on ice and we have to steal. Why ice? Why isn't there ice everywhere? There just isn't. Don't worry about it. Now we have to steal ice. Hey, you're going to have to run across this desert planet. Well, why don't we fly across it in our starship? No, you landed the starship. You got captured. Something happened. There are people with big weird vehicles with skulls on them and giant wheels and little teeny tiny wagon wheels at the bottom. Uh, and that's just the way it is. As long it, it's... My friends and I sometimes call that attitude a beer and pretzels game. That is an activity to engage in while drinking beer and eating pretzels, or in our case, usually a root beer and pretzels game. Then, go ahead, go back, go back to the horrible face. Uh, they have the space herpy. Now, this is obviously an effort at a joke, but it is also a fascinating sci-fi trope that a lot of people don't put in their games despite it showing up a lot. This is obviously an add to Alien, and what it is is a small alien life form that gets loose and runs along on the ship, and the threat isn't that it is so stand-up combat dangerous that you're, you're at risk of it beating you in a fair fight. It's that it's small and fast and can hide and can sneak up on you when you're sleeping, and it can infect you. That is the same as the early stages of the movie Alien. Uh, and I will be talking on my blog, uh, which should go up tomorrow, about how to have the small, tiny terror uh, as a stat block, as a kind of encounter in Starfinder. Because you can't do it using the normal Starfinder monster rules. They would just say, hey, it's got this KAC, this EAC, and it does this much damage, and everyone will have a chance to shoot at it. You can get that off the screen now. It's it's disgusting. We don't have to make people watch that. It's, um but it's so, uh, it's legitimately. Go ahead. Uh, so you're going to do a blog post about. We're not going to call it how to do a space harpy in Starfinder. We're going to talk no. about how to do a, a small, fast threat on your starship. Tiny terrors, yeah. Tiny totally. terrors. Okay, okay. Possibly infectious tiny terrors. I'm not done writing it yet, but the, the point is that if you've got people in any kind of space uh, where they can't just walk away, be that a starship, uh, especially since Starfinder tends to have days or weeks of starship travel that you don't want to drop out. Uh, if you're in a space station, if you have huddled for safety uh, on a, a abandoned base on a, a planet and an ion storm is coming through, there are places where you can force the players to deal with a more suspenseful search skill-based series of encounters where there's a threat and that threat isn't something they can just wait to walk up and shoot at. And I hadn't, until we decided to hit this movie, which also has some comedy, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the comedy in role-playing here, but I don't think I'm going to do an article on it because I, I think I think it comes out better if you hear me. So this is not something I think will go up well on the Patreon. But it had not occurred to me until I rewatched it that that trope, which, I mean, it should, there's a movie called Screamers that has little tiny robots that do that. Uh, there are Cybermats and Doctor Who... The, the trope of the dangerous sci-fi thing that you don't know where it is, that it can hide well, and that it's in the space that you're stuck in, is a super common trope, and it's not something you see uh, in most stand-up combat-based role-playing games, but you perfectly well could. All the skills, all the rules, all of the saving throws are in there. So I'll talk about how to do that. The other thing that I noticed is that um, a lot of what Ice Pirates does is set up ridiculous situations and then hope the audience finds them funny rather than specifically telling jokes, right? Um, you don't have, for example, if you look at Spaceballs, you literally have Mel Brooks going, merchandising, merchandising, merchandising. He is breaking the fourth wall, 
telling jokes. Ship's too long. Had to run. Watch the movie to be over. Um, for that matter, there's the, the point where they watch the videotape in Spaceballs because now videotapes come out so fast that what you're seeing now happens now. In Ice Pirates, they set up ridiculous situations and hope you laugh at the incongruity of it. The reason I'm talking about this at such length is in my experience, it is much more successful in a role-playing game to set up odd situations and, and incongruous elements and ideas and then have the player find the humor and be funny than it is to try and write jokes into a game. Right. If if you decide that there's going to be uh, space armored centurions, uh, including one named uh, Inaccura Miss, right, and everyone will then joke that well, Inaccura Miss can't hit the broadside of a barn, but it really breaks the idea that we are role playing. That that very much takes it out to the game area. Whereas if you instead head up a situation where you're like, hey, there are a bunch of armored troopers, they've got ray guns, their ray guns are more effective than their melee attacks, but they are hideously untrained in them and they are inaccurate, although they do a lot of damage if they hit. And then you just get the scene where the, the armored troops line up and are shooting at the players and can't hit anyone for anything. The players then have that opportunity to make the joke that only Imperial Stormtroopers have such accuracy where they can't shoot a player character to save their lives. So this is something that uh, I went a little more in depth on as a designer for my very first adventure that I was developing for Paizo, which was uh, Peril and Plunder, which was supposed to have the kind of comedy uh, piracy feel similar to, for example, Pirates of the Caribbean. And we told the writers that it was supposed to be kind of funny. And so the adventure writers tried to work in a bunch of jokes into the adventure and it was terrible. It was awful. It, and it's not their fault, right? We told them to do it. But every time they tried to work a pun into someone's title or have something that, you know, here's a list of five funny things that the bard may say, it always fell flat. We did some playtesting and none of it worked. Whereas if you just set up situations like we have a big chase scene uh, in that adventure so that players can decide, okay, how am I getting across this bridge quickly and they will describe the funny things they do because all I heard is a die roll. So, you know, I, I hop across the heads of the people on the bridge to get to the other side. And the die roll supports however you want to do it. The comedy evolves naturally. And I want some of that sort of uh, comes from, uh, what's the line, pretentious way to say this? Uh, well, well, this is pretentious. The duality of an RPG product. Because there's a lot of people who buy their, the book, The Adventure, and they're never going to play it. Yeah, but they have an enjoyable experience reading it when there's jokes in there. And whereas for the folks playing it, as you point out from your play tests, those jokes just kind of lie out there on the page and don't do anything for the play experience. And you, uh, you can you can stick cute notes in on how you write things, right? You you can do a description of someone and and say you know if if confronted with the fact that they are actually secretly the axe murderer. Uh, they will stare at the players as if the players had all just turned into rabbits and they don't know how to respond to it. And that isn't a joke that the GM is likely to tell the players, but it might get a chuckle out of the reader. Um, I just think that when you try to actually have the situation where the players are being asked to dress up like bunnies as the characters do that in order to take someone by surprise, uh, there's more eye rolling than there is chuckling. Now, I'm of the opinion that almost every role-playing group is funny. I do game night quotes uh, whenever I am playing in a game. And every time I do that with a new group, I get the permission, hey, are you guys okay if I put up game night quotes? It'll be hashtag game night quotes. I won't say who does anything unless it's me and I'm, I'm get specific permission. I'll just be quoting or paraphrasing the funny thing we said. Every group without fail has said, well, I've read your name right, game night quotes and we're not that funny. <clears throat> They're all that funny. Every group is that funny. It's just that no one remembers the, the remark that we said in this, the flow of the moment unless someone happens to note it and, in my case, put it up on social media. So I think there are a way to play to the strengths of various people. Um, you know, if, if you know everyone is a fan of UHS, there is no reason not to, as a GM, crack, hey, these guys all have ogre hooks. They must have gotten them at Overhook City. 
and then everyone can break into Ogre Hook City, Ogre Hook City. Nothing says I love you like an ogre from Ogre Hook City. We sell ogre hooks and nothing else. But that is playing with these people that you know at the table, or at least get a vibe from them. Uh, and it sounds, it's um, so it sounds like your, your point of view is, if you want to create a funny game, the odds are more in your favor if you create funny situations and sort of feed those straight lines to the players and let them discover the comedy organically. Yeah, and having NPCs be straight men is a, mm -hmm. a great way to set up players to be funny. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I just wanted to call out, um, oh, Bear, I'm trying to say your name. Be patient with me, sir. Edo um, who I call Bear. Uh, holy cow, I've not seen Ice Pirates since the 80s. I remember we had to run a VCR for it because we didn't have one yet. But also when I saw Press Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi for the first time. Yeah, uh, and for, um, for a lot of people, Ice Pirates was from the era of Star Wars. It was, it was part and parcel of being a sci-fi fan at the time. You know, Owen, we still are in the era of Star Wars in a certain sense. Uh, no, we're not. We're not in the era of Star Wars. We're in an era when Star Wars occurs. But Star Wars changed the movie landscape forever. I don't even yeah. think we're in the era of the MCU anymore, which changed the movie landscape forever. Um, Die Hard changed the movie landscape forever. John Wick may have successfully changed the movie landscape forever. Right now, I think we are in the era of streaming channels. I think that's what's changing entertainment the way Star Wars did at the time. And people who watch the show will know we've done a fair number of, of bits on this show about movies and, and sometimes mentioned series that are streaming only on Prime or only on Netflix or, or whatever. I guess it's the advantage of picking up older media is people are more likely to have seen it. Whereas if you don't have Prime, for instance, you couldn't say, watch The Tomorrow War. Right. Although we're now going so far back. I mean, we are picking a movie so old that some of the people that I game with and work with weren't alive when this movie came out. It, for, for them, there is no difference between mentioning this movie uh, and mentioning the black and white Kong movie. It's, it's all pre their lifespan. But that can serve another useful purpose. Uh, all three of us, when we mentioned Ice Pirates last time, we're like, yeah, we should do a show about Ice Pirates. Uh, and having gone back and watched some of it, wow, a lot of Ice Pirates doesn't stand up. There are some, it's a very 80s movie. So there are some terrible, terrible choices that were made uh, narratively and special effects and acting and, and in what was considered appropriate content. But that was still possible to look at it and go, oh yeah, here's this idea that, that I haven't applied elsewhere. Going to older movies, sometimes if you if you predate your your group, can be a great way to get ideas and, and narratives and, and plot points and even characterizations that you can throw at people uh, and not have them have a, a built-in reaction of, oh, that's from Aliens 4 or that's, that, you know, it's, it's a John Wick joke. We killed the orc's dog and it was going to kill us. Uh, the other big game mechanical thing that I think is really interesting about Ice Pirates is that the end of Ice... And spoilers for a 40-year-old movie. Uh, Ice Pirate ends with a fight in a, a time vortex where all of the characters, heroes and villains included, are getting older and older and older and older. So the longer the encounter goes, the more of a penalty everybody is at. Uh, and that can be an interesting way to kick up a scenario by, you know, telling people you can't just wait because this is getting harder and harder and harder. But at the same time, it turns out there are no consequences because they win. So because at the end of that, having won, everything goes back to the way it was for those people beginning, including the ones that died. If you set up a scenario like that as a GM and the players know all we have to do is succeed even dying does not prevent us from succeeding and moving forward. You can get a very different play style and you might not want to deal with time. It can be very wibbly wobbly, although we've got in Starfinder things like witch warpers. So alternate realities very much have an option, right? If you've seen everything everywhere all at once, it would be not difficult to look at that and say, okay, you've been caught in a witch warp. Uh, and alternate reality versions of you are having to work together to end something. So we're going to play out this fight, and your character will remember this fight, but whatever happens to you might not happen to you. It can happen to an alternate version of you. So no consequences from this are going to fall on you as long as you achieve this objective. <coughs> it would also be easy to do something like say, hey, it's uh, the hollow chamber, 
or uh, we, the danger room from X-Men, right? We, we want to test you all to your limits, uh, or if you want to join this organization, or if you want to earn our trust so that we will hire you for this dangerous job, we're going to put you in the situation and all your characters have to do is walk across the room and press the button. And there's no actual damage, no actual expending of resources. It's all virtual. And then your players can unload whatever they want uh, and take risks and sacrifice themselves in a way that they won't be willing to do unless they know that this one-off, this side quest, won't actually result in the loss of their precious grenade that they've been paying half their wealth for or their life or whatever. And as a as a change of pace, I think that can be another really fun element that I got the idea from, from watching this really old, let's be honest, not that good movie uh, that I just had fond memories of. Jacob, what you, uh, you watched the whole movie? So yes. what what did you what did you pick out of this that I haven't mentioned? Well, uh, actually, there's something that I want to go back to. Something you said at the beginning, okay. in, the, in the regards of you saying that uh, they're carrying swords and melee weapons yeah. for no reason, uh, and there's that. There's actually a pretty decent reason. Uh, having watched the movie just yesterday, sure. Any time they use one of their laser guns, a sizable explosion happens at the end of it. So. If you're trying to do something like capture ice, you don't want one of your stray shots to blow a big chunk of what you're of what you're uh, trying to steal up, or and have that water melt. Um, or per or by off chance, you're fighting on starships in space. What if a stray shot hits the hull of the ship? and blows a hole out into space, there's a very good reason for using swords and melee weapons instead of these super high-powered energy weapons. Well, that's like the uh, the quote from Hunter and Robert October. You know, lots of things on the submarine don't react well to being shot with bullets. Exactly. Or for that matter, the same concept in Aliens, right? You're right under the heat converters of the nuclear reactor that powers this place. A stray bullet could, and in fact eventually does, cause a problem for all of us. So <clears throat> absolutely, this is another case where there's a, an idea that you can take from this that has been played in a lot of other uh, media where you can say, hey, uh, even though you guys are normally using laser weapons and flamethrowers and grenades all the time, uh, for example, you could go as simple as to say, uh, welcome to the explosive atmosphere methane world uh, this stuff's illegal, and it's illegal for a good reason. Or uh, you are facing fire elementals that are healed, healed by heat damage, but not by melee weapons. Oh, and if you happen to have a cold weapon, that can give you an advantage. Or even just, uh, this is a starship made of magic origami. If you if any attack goes beyond an adjacent square, you're going to rip a hole through the whole ship. Our solar sail will go. We're, we're yep. all doomed. Yep. But there's also, there's a, a sort of shameless wahoo gonzoness about ice pirates oh absolutely I, I think a lot of it came from the fact that you know there's some i would say unfunny uh castration jokes and some some questionable uh things that i i don't know that i would find humorous today and I'm, i don't find myself in a position where i can exactly recommend this movie in particular whereas i thought i could before i started rewatching it um but there is a a embracing of the ridiculousness by the whole thing, right? They, they, they turn the Gonzo up to 11 and just go for it. And I think it works better than some other movies at the time, exactly because there is no sense of being embarrassed by what it is. This, this is a B movie uh, Gonzo comedy. You could tell how they were marketing it from the 33 seconds that we watched of the preview. And there's not, any effort to claim that it has a greater, higher purpose. Uh, no one is winning any acting awards in this. There's no effort for a deep backstory or, or a tragic side quest. They they have the one ridiculous conceit and they drive it home in every scene so they can get to the next idea they've stolen from some better movie and play through it and hope people enjoy what they've done with it. Yeah. For, yeah, for, the, for those who, who get a chance to see Ice Pirates. There, there is some 
content warning we want to put on it because there there is so uh, some very obvious racism moments it's like despite the fact that there are aliens in this universe uh black people are still second class citizens and referred to by the n-word uh, yeah, oh wow i don't know <laughs> As I so said, they, I haven't seen the whole they movie. Say it. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> absolutely content worth warning worth mentioning for people. Um, yeah, it's it's a product of its era, and uh, I am probably going to decide not to suggest we do shows about forty year old content without having watched it recently next time around. Which I mean, lesson learned. Um, Fair enough. I can tell you, this reminds me a lot more of like Cannonball Run or Smoking the Bandit than uh, yeah. Star Wars. Well, I, I think it was an effort to to do the Cannonball Run or Smokey and the Bandit. Actually, Cannonball Run, yes. Smokey and the Bandit is not as ridiculous and over the top as Cannonball Run, right? You won't have anyone leaping out claiming to be a superhero in a cape uh, in Smokey and the Bandit. So there's there's a, a greater ridiculousness level, and I do think we hit that level of insanity uh, in Ice Pirates. And, I mean, it was a financial flop, and either the producer or the director went on to direct Mac and Me, famously one of the worst sci-fi movies ever. Uh, it's It's got a, a MST3K version, and even that doesn't really make it watchable. It's just so bad. So there, there was, it's not all just about having their budget slashed in half and deciding not to be serious. There, there were some some choices made that clearly those people went off and made similar choices later, so Maybe they're just people that make bad choices. It does happen. But well, I, I mean, originally promised you a short, fun, and fast podcast when I pitched this series to you. I wanna, yes. We have just hit uh, 31 minutes on the hour. Okay. Uh, you have anything to add before we go, Mike? Um, please check out Owen's blog at owenkcstevens.com. Uh, please check out Owen's Patreon at... Do you have that URL handy, Owen? Uh, I'll have it by the time Jacob said anything. Jacob, say something. Uh, if you enjoy content like this, please consider supporting the Banff Podcast Patreon, which is, I know, we're trying to advertise two Patreons at the same time. So, so give us my, your money. We want your another, money. Give my, us your money. My is patreon.com slash Owen Casey Stevens all run together. Um, but this is a Banff Podcast, so by all means, support Banff. Uh, yes, and I will I will hit you up for money tomorrow when I put my article up. Cool. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in, and we will catch you next time on the Bath Podcast. <laughs>